Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoy this session that is being brought to you by Waste Expo together online. It's beyond the basics of PFAS, and it will help you find out where we stand now and what might be coming down the pike when it comes to managing PFAS. And you'll hear from speakers uh, Stephen Zemba, Nikki Delude Roy, and moderated by Ivan Cooper. So enjoy. I hope you learn a lot and let us know what you think. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for Beyond the Basics of PFAS. My name is Ivan Cooper. I'm a principal with civil and environmental consultants in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm chair of SWANA's Leachate and Landfill Liquids Committee. I'll be your moderator today, and I'm excited to be hosting this session for you. Well, per and polyfluorinated substances, PFAS are not a new issue for the waste and recycling industry, but with so much changing in the past year, it may be difficult to know where we stand with managing PFAS and regulations are happening left and right. Additional research is being conducted, treatments continue to be developed, and new concerns beyond the landfill are cropping up. The Go Beyond the Basics of PFAS session will discuss where we stand now and what be, may be coming up or coming down the pike in the near future that it comes to managing PFAS. There are many facets to addressing PFAS for solid waste managers and professionals. And here's some of them. We'll you know, look at the history, sources of controlling of waste inputs, the regulations, impending surface water standards, changes to NPDES permits, sampling and analytical techniques, groundwater monitoring, prevention of the PFAS and groundwater spreading, stormwater management, surface water control, and down the list, especially the impact of facilities and costs. And today we'll also be sharing some, uh, some case studies. Well, let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to today, today's speakers. Stephen G. Zemba, PhD PE, is a project director with Sanborn Head. Nikki Dulud Roy is vice president, she's a PhD with Geo Insights. Steve's expertise on the larger issue of the PFAS cycle with sources and issues with biosolids. Nikki will focus on waste management, surface water, and other leachate issues, and both will share some case studies. So today's study we've divided into several topics. The three main ones are the sources of PFAS in landfills, as well as the regulation context, uh, as well as water issues and landfill gas. And then I'll present a summary of the treatment technologies. Um, so each of these is going to present each topic for about 10 minutes, followed by um, some discussion, and then we'll end hopefully with time for a Q&A session at the end. Well, I have a question, Nikki and Steve. What do you see as the main issue with regulations? Okay, Nikki and Steve, the floor is yours. Appreciate the introduction, Ivan. Thank you. I I'll guess I'll field that first by saying that um, regular regulations across the country are changing day to day, moment to moment. Uh, in particular, I've put a couple of example states up on the slide in front of you just to talk through uh, the sort of game of limbo that regulators seem to be adopting across the country. It really has become a bit of a race to the bottom and, and an attempt to, uh, as each state adopts standards, they seem to be lower and lower. Most recently, I think Michigan adopted standards as of early August 2020. Um, their numbers are even lower than the numbers adopted by New Hampshire, New Jersey, and, and proposed in New York. One of the really challenging things about regulations when it comes to drinking water and groundwater has really been the fact that not only are states left on their own to adopt uh, standards because the federal government hasn't gone through the process of adopting a federal MCL as of yet, um, is also the fact that each state is also sort of focused on a different number and different um, selection of PFAS compounds. So remember that PFAS 
is a, an umbrella term that encompasses a number of different compounds that have different chemistries and different um, molecular structures. Each state is really focused on a, a different number of those. So you'll see in the slide that New Hampshire, for example, has focused on four um, P PFOS compounds. PFOA and PFOS are the two probably most common and, and ones that everyone on the, on the call is most familiar with. Um, but they're also looking at PFHXS and PFNA. Then you transition to another state like Massachusetts where um, they've actually expanded that list, certainly includes PFOA and PFOS, but it's also introduced PFDA um, and PFHPA as two new compounds that they're interested in. And then in, take one more step into the state of Michigan, where their list is considerably longer. They're even looking at um, and having adopted a standard relative to Gen X, which is one of the replacement compounds that folks may have heard of. So, so not only are you struggling across the country if you're um, if you're dealing with multiple facilities in multiple states, trying to keep the numbers um, straight, but you also need to know in which state. Uh, which state is focused on which compounds themselves. And then I'll add one more complexity to trying to track it regulations, which is that, uh, for example, New Hampshire and New Jersey and Michigan have compound specific regulatory limits, whereas states like Massachusetts, uh, Vermont, which didn't make it onto the slide, actually look at a combined total and not individual numbers for each compound. So this has really become an incredibly challenging regulatory um, framework to try to follow. And I'm hoping that Steve will give us some background on the health impacts and why we're really seeing this race to the bottom, these lower and lower numbers each, state, each time a state comes forward with a new regulatory limit. Steve, can you tell us more about that? I can indeed, Nikki. Thank you. And I mean, maybe I'll start with Ivan's question, which is actually going to toss the ball back to you, Nikki in a second here is what the most challenging issues are. Certainly that lack of a federal MCL has led kind of to this whole situation that you see that, that Nikki talked about with every state on its own and every state having to interpret, if you will, a different set of toxicological data, which given all that uncertainty, it's hard to do. And if you wanna be more careful than the state beside you, you adopt a lower number. I think the next big challenge, and, and Nikki will get to this in a minute or two, is surface water, because that's going to affect a lot more people. Right now, so far, all we've kind of focused on is groundwater and drinking water. And if you're not drinking the water, uh, as you might not be near a solid waste facility, for instance, you don't have usually a lot of public water supplies near a landfill, or hopefully you don't. Uh, but if you, that's limited in, in your scope as to what you might eventually have to control, remediate, and provide fresh water for. I'm trained as a health risk assessor, so I wanted to give you a couple of perspectives on health risks and why people are, if you will, all over the board in terms of the compounds they're looking at and the levels. The first thing that's true, and this relates directly back to drinking water, is that if you have PFAS in your water, especially PFOA and PFOS, the two eight carbon compounds, chances are you're going to see it in your blood. And what that shows on this chart are median levels of blood serum concentrations of PFOA found in people's blood in communities where the drinking water has been affected by PFOA. And it's kind of a, a rule of thumb, if you will, that says that uh, if you have, a, for every 10 parts per trillion you have in your drinking water, your blood level goes up by one part per billion. Now we all have these compounds in our blood, the background levels of about two parts per billion uh, in blood in you and I and everybody else right now. But if you have PFOA in your drinking water, you can see some of these communities like uh, the community in Ohio that's the subject of the Dark Waters movie. They have more than 10 times as much PFOA in their blood. And that really scares people and it scares regulators. And there's another inset on this slide. The same is true if you can hit the slide again. Uh, to get that yes, animation. Prefos levels show the same thing. The national average there is about between four and five parts per billion, but there's one individual living down gradient of a landfill that took a lot of PFAS containing materials that they've measured 3,200 parts per billion in her blood, 800 times the level as the national average. Next slide, please. Uh, and if there's a good news piece to this, 
or bad news. I don't know which way you want to look at this. Uh, the levels are coming down over time in all of our blood. These are from the national blood bank samples from 1999 to 2013. The axes on the left are PFOA and on the right are PFOS. And what you'll see in this here, if you look at it carefully, is uh, levels in the average levels in blood have gone from about five to two parts per billion for PFOA and from about 30 to five parts per billion for PFOS. Now, if you think about that microwave popcorn we ate back in the 1990s and you remember the microwave popcorn scare, that's when uh, these chemicals were used in a lot of food packaging and it still exists and we still have background exposure, but the elimination of PFOA and PFOS from the manufacturing cycle and the stewardship program view has reduced these levels quite a bit. But think about where we were back in the 1990s. We were like communities that had high levels in their drinking water are now. So we've all been exposed to these compounds. And really, I had to react this way to this hot headline of a relationship between PFAS and COVID-19. That's all we need right now in terms of, you know, I've got my COVID beard here, but uh, of all the things that we really need, we, we, do we need that interaction? And here's the relationship and why there might be one. The health effect that is of most concern to a lot of regulators right now and leads to a lot of the uncertainty is the thought that PFAS might affect the immune systems of children and weaken those immune systems. And if you weaken your immune system when you're young, it doesn't develop as well. And then suddenly you're more uh, apt or susceptible to getting COVID-19 when you're older. Now, I don't think it takes a lot of imagination to, to figure out that quantifying that is almost impossible because we don't really have the data or the tools in the animal studies to look at you know what those quantitative dose response relationships would be. So people are guessing, people are putting in extra safety factors. Uh, you're coming up with things like this. This is a model that was used by New Hampshire to develop their uh, MCL for PFOA of 12 parts per trillion. And it's based on two generations. And but the centerpiece there is that child. And after the child is born, the child nurses for a year and develops a level of 21 parts per billion in child's blood at the end of one year. That's the key number that regulators are trying to limit in this case. They're applying a model that includes a lot of pharmacokinetic parameters to try and get at that. There are a lot of assumptions. These models tend to be very conservative because that's the job of regulators. So if you look at a parameter, we can actually see you know, some ground truthing to. Uh, one of the ratios you could look at is the blood level that comes up in the woman by the time she delivers her baby. And it's about four parts per billion in her blood. Notice she transfers most of that fofoa in her system over to her baby in one year. So large, smaller body weight, much higher concentration in the baby at 21 uh, parts per billion. But the, that ratio, uh, the equilibrium ratio between what's in the mother's blood compared to what's in the drinking water is about 300 in this case. Empirical ratios are more like 100 to 150. So there's a lot of reason to believe these models are being very careful about what they're doing. But these life cycle models with a lot of different assumptions and a lot of different parameters of what people are using to establish some of these very, very low standards. And again, the concerns about the immunological effects of that child. At this point, I'm getting handed back to Nikki, who's gonna talk about what I think is a great concern, and I think she does too, surface water standards, which are probably gonna be lower than drinking water standards and affect a lot more industries. Hey, Steve, before we jump to surface water, um, and I think it might be really important to emphasize that, that your description on this slide was, was extraordinarily important. Um, and this is different, correct me if I'm wrong, um, than really the way we've typically approached setting standards in the past or for other chemicals. Is that right? Yeah, a typical approach would be, in, in this case, to take an animal study, rats and mice, which, by the way, are very, very lousy models for people in terms of looking at how PFOA and PFOS behave. Uh, the the half-lives of these chemicals in, in rodents of like rats and mice are about four days to two weeks, and it's hard to extrapolate those data to people. But what you typically do in that type of study is you'd say, look at liver effects or some other health effect and apply a bunch of safety factors to the animal study results. The slight nuance here that you're describing is you're taking the animal study to get what is the critical level in the child, and it's actually twice that level at the one-year-old, but you're getting that from the animal study, the blood serum target level that might be causing some you know, 
effects, slight effects in the animals, you're having that to account for background exposure. So limiting it to 20.6 micrograms per liter and trying to match that. But the animal studies behind it, it's just not used in the traditional way. It's a much more complex use of animal studies. Yeah. And I think that's important because it sort of has shifted the way that we set uh, regulatory limits or that the regulators do. And, and I think if that model continues forward, it may actually, um, you know, have some interesting impacts on what I'll say is emerging contaminants that haven't yet emerged, um, those that might be coming down the pike, uh, but also maybe even a look back on some of the chemicals that we regulate today and have um, if we if we look at them from a different perspective and, and focus on this blood serum question. So I just bring that up as a, as a really, everyone always wants to understand why we're really talking about really low levels at the part per trillion basis here. Um, and it's really because this model has kind of taken everything that we used to do in this in this field and turned it on its head a little bit. Yeah, and you know, you need to get involved if you're a stakeholder in this process early on in the game. If you're going to submit comments, either way, you think the models aren't conservative enough or you think they're more protective, the time to do it is in establishing the regulations. By the time the regulations come out, okay, these models get cemented. And But there's so much uncertainty in these models and so much room to comment and so much room to do better. We could be doing a lot better toxicity studying right now than we are. We would spend a few million dollars and maybe sit, you know, shore up those levels and find out how low we need to go. Well, on that note, I'll take that back and go back to your original um, sort of comments about surface water because that really is another question of how low do we need to go. Um, you know, there are a number of states that have started to look at surface water um, really to uh, that have ad fully adopted surface water standards. And although PFOA is, um, tends to be the compound that we focus on when we talk about human health, um, when we shift over to the eco um, end of things, PFOS is really the ecological or the more toxic um, ecological uh, compound. And so it's really PFOS where we're seeing these incredibly low concentrations. Um, if you recall back to my earlier drinking and groundwater um, slide, you know, for PFOS, we're looking at New Hampshire has a, a standard of 15 parts per trillion and um, uh, New Jersey has 13 parts per trillion. So, you know, in that low teens part per trillion, those are the same concentrations that we're seeing being regulated um, or adopted as surface water standards. So Michigan has an 11 part per trillion PFOS standard. And then Florida, again, in this race to go lower, um, or I guess more fairly, this race to be sure that we're incorporating a number of layers of conservatism because of the uncertainty around these compounds. Um, we're seeing a, a regulatory surface water standard of four parts per trillion. And that has really significant impacts if we take um, and think through how surface water can be impacted at landfills. So Steve, the, um, I guess the first comment is really to think through how PFAS cycle through our environment. And, um, and maybe I'll hand it back to you to, to talk about leachate and the impacts of leachate in our environment and how those connect to all of the different types of places where these regulatory standards might apply. Yeah, and you know, as, as you were mentioning, Nikki, the, the relationship here to surface water is very important because every wastewater treatment plant discharges to surface water. And now it's not just the landfill downgrading and drinking water wells you need to worry about, but it's the surface water systems. And you know, there's a tie-in back to the human health side on those very, very low uh, surface water standards for PFOS because PFOS bioconcentrates in fish. And the pathway that's driving those standards is actually people eating fish that have PFOS in them, but the bioconcentration factors drive those levels to below the drinking water standards. Uh, this notion of the, the PFOS or PFAS cycle came about in a couple of conversations we were having with people. But you know, there's a relationship, a common one between landfills and wastewater treatment plants. And that is that a lot of landfills send their leachate and liquids to wastewater treatment plants where they're quote unquote treated, although not a whole lot happens to PFAS in a wastewater treatment plant. And then the, the wastewater treatment plant relies on the landfill in often cases to take a lot of the sludge. I mean, you can do a couple of things with the sludge. You can you know, prepare it into biosolids and land apply it. That has its own issues that we don't have a whole lot of time to go into today. But just putting PFAS back into the landfill is a source to the landfill. So this idea of a cycle came up. Is, are we, what we're doing here is just cycling back the PFAS from 
the landfill to the wastewater treatment plant from the wastewater treatment plant back to the landfill. And I think it will tell us the answer to that. So what I wanted to show was a calculation done on the PFAS cycle. And this comes from data that were collected in Vermont. Uh, they took samples of wastewater treatment plant sludge and they took samples of landfill leachate. And if you look at how much leachate is coming out of the landfill times the concentrations of PFAS in that uh, leachate and compared the amount of sludge that was going into the landfill from wastewater treatment plants times the sludge concentrations, you can now do a mass balance, which is how you should be doing these things, not just looking at concentrations. And if you look at that mass balance, you know, they come out in the grams per day, which isn't a very big number for PFAS it is, uh, but they're both of several grams per day order of magnitude. But here's the real tricky thing here. And if you're colorblind, I'm sorry, you're gonna miss this, but those colors are different. The PFAS compounds are different. What's coming out of the landfill in leachate are a lot of the short chain compounds, things like PFBA, PFBS, what, and a little bit of PFOA actually in the yellow bar there. That kind of matches the, uh, the sludge coming into the landfill, but the sludge coming into the landfill is chock full of things like PFOS and the very bright blue bar and some of the precursor compounds, which could be converting, and that, that's a question, uh, and a complexity that there's a lot of PFOS coming into the landfill that is not coming out of the landfill. And there's a lesson there for sequestration that landfills are actually holding onto, I think, a lot of the PFAS. But the compounds coming into the landfill and going out of the landfill are different. So this is not a cycle so much as a series of mass transfers into and out of the landfill. Landfills receiving PFOS, giving up PFOS, but different PFOS. This prompted a study that we worked on in Vermont. Vermont was interested in, in learning about what the sources of PFAS were to the landfill. And we went out and did some very interesting sampling. We did things like mattress covers and broke those up into pieces and put them in jars and came up with a method. I, needless to say, you know, the lack of published methods for PFAS, these were not published methods. These are research type methods that we're looking at. But what we wanted to get at was what were the important sources of PFAS to the landfill? And so what we did was we analyzed a bunch of things, sludge, contaminated soils, bulky items, uh, C and D materials, things like carpeting, since we know carpets can be coated with PFOS type coatings, and also looked at uh, the waste from suspected industries. What we didn't sample was general municipal solid waste. It's a hard thing to sample and homogenize if you think about it, it's a very heterogeneous material. But by default, uh, that was gonna be a potential source of PFAS. So what, we then did was we made a bunch of lags. We basically tried to estimate how many mattresses come into a landfill and how much contaminated soil, we have a pretty good handle on that, did they take? And the sludges were fairly well quantified. Some of the things like the bulky items and the C and D materials are gonna have some uncertainty. But what we did was we calculated the amount of PFAS coming into the landfill, and then we again looked at the leachate on the other side and the amount of PFAS coming out of the landfill. And the next chart shows ratios of that parameter. And the blue bars basically would be the case where for that particular PFAS, the amount coming into the landfill was larger than the amount coming out of the landfill. And in some cases, more than a thousand fold PFAS is coming into the landfill and is coming out in the leachate. That's a very good argument for those PFAS that there is sequestration going on in the landfill. Uh, a couple of compounds that went the other way. There was actually more PFAS coming out of the landfill in leachate than was coming in in the waste. Now, some of that might have been some precursor degradation, but probably more of it was related to the fact that we did not sample the correct materials to see those PFAS compounds. My personal theory is that a lot of the shorter chain compounds are now being used in things like food packaging. And a lot of that is leaching out. Those materials have been shown to degrade very quickly in landfills and release their PFAS. Uh, so the PFAS cycle is a complex one. And I think that, you know, I need to transfer this back to Nikki, I believe. But the uh, lesson here is that it's a complex thing. And, you know, landfills and wastewater treatment plants shouldn't be making some hasty decisions that we've seen in the news about whether you accept waste or don't accept waste. They are both PFAS management facilities, and these mass fluxes are important. And to say that landfills, you know, should stop taking all PFAS waste, I think it's impossible to do, number one. But should wastewater treatment plants then stop taking, you know, leachate from landfills? The answer might be maybe in some cases, and that gets back to the surface water issues. 
that Nikki is going to talk about now. But maybe you want to comment on that a little bit, Nikki, from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really complex challenge, right? Is um, landfills are in the business of receiving waste and, and being a receptor for the materials that we as society kind of have to do something with. And certainly, we'll, I think we'll wrap back around to this at the end of the talk. But, you know, incineration, some of our other, maybe our only other option, um, is maybe one that has some challenges around it with regards to this topic as well. So there isn't a really simple. Um, yeah, landfills should just stop taking this material kind of solution to this problem. Um, but there are some things I think that landfills can do and can think about uh, as they plan to um, manage stormwater runoff. Um, and I'm going to talk about those as I speak, talk through this and use this case study as an example. Um, I think this is a little bit more straightforward and perhaps gives everybody on the phone something as a an, a, as an operator of a facility maybe to wrap your arms around is something you can proactively control versus the waste stream which is a lot more challenging because we don't have a lot of alternatives for um, our deposition of our waste so um, hopefully folks know a little bit about the coakley landfill uh, it's a super fun site in Rye, New Hampshire, uh, I guess Hampton and Greenland, New Hampshire, uh, Rye's right there as well. Um, and they had a really interesting sort of PFAS history. Um, I'll begin the story with the idea that uh, no one associated with the Superfund project, I think, proactively went looking for PFAS. Um, at least in surface water, it was actually a group of community members who went out and tested and started collecting samples and testing um, nearby surface water and um, wetlands. And so, you know, it's not always a proactive or even regulatory driven um, issue where you're, you're having to deal with PFAS and some of these larger profile sites um, and, and landfills certainly fall in that category. Um, sometimes you're in a, a reactionary mode where someone hands the regulator the data on your, on your behalf. Um, so that certainly happened here. And so there was some PFAS, pretty high concentrations of PFAS detected in um, wetland as well as a couple of water bodies adjacent to in the, in the vicinity of the Superfund site. And so in response, the, the PRP group uh, had their consultant um, issue or, or to research and then come together with this stormwater investigation report, which is available, um, it's publicly available on DES in New Hampshire. We have a, a great database that you can pull this report down and I encourage folks to do so to take a read through it because really what they did was um, try to understand the chemical composition of stormwater um, and then the relationship between stormwater and groundwater and then um, as well as surface water. And so what they did was they actually sampled um, cap material as well as um, system cut sort of construction materials that would have um, contact with stormwater. Um, on the cover system, um, they sampled topsoil, um, so that upper layer, as you see on the slide, and they sampled the common borrow soil, and then they also uh, collected sample of the uh, flexible membrane liner, the FML. The topsoil samples had the highest concentration of PFOS detected in each of those three areas. Um, they actually had the highest number of PFAS compounds as well. So there were 26 compounds reported as part of the analytical report. Um, and there was were, there were 10 PFAS compounds reported in that topsoil material. And so part of, you know, Steve alluded to the idea that we have, um, as wastewater treatment facilities generate their uh, effluent, they have the, the sort of wet, wet or water side of it, but they also have the sludge material and often, um, you have to really think about where topsoil is coming from and what the uh, amended portion of topsoil actually is and where that comes from. A lot of times in a lot of states um, that biosolids has been given a, a beneficial reuse product designation and it, so it makes its way into topsoil as, a, as part of the amendment or it's um, part of compost that may ultimately also generate its, or find its way into topsoil. So the source of topsoil is very important in this uh, stormwater investigation uh, report associated with Coakley really points at that as a potential source of PFAS in stormwater. Um, in addition, though, the common borrow soil, so that 24 inch layer as part of the cap, that also had um, PFAS concentrations ranging on the order of 12 to 20 parts per billion. So not ins insignificant and certainly um, given some of the 
molecular and chemical components of PFAS, something that could potentially impact uh, stormwater. And then, um, interestingly, the, um, there were detections of PFOA and PFOS associated with the FML, um, although the concentrations were relatively minor and relatively low. So it really kind of gives us the sense that the materials that go into capping really need to be well understood before they're used um, and then managed. And then it kind of also brings up this question uh, of closure turf. I've talked to a number of manufacturers of closure turf who, um, quite frankly, haven't done the investigations relative to PFAS. And, um, and there's a lot of question out there without a lot of data to answer the question. So that's sort of another area where, um, as, as folks look at closing facilities or managing facilities, just things to really think through and make sure that you aren't importing an issue onto your site. And, and at least you can kind of look at that uh, proactively. So stormwater continues to be a challenge. Um, and in particular, um, stormwater becomes a much bigger issue as we adopt surface water standards. And if you recall back to that conversation about surface water standards, which are going to be very low and driven by PFOS for the reasons that Steve and I discussed. Um, if you look at Michigan where they adopted a surface water standard and then they, they kind of looked at sources of um, impacts to surface water, they identified uh, in the Huron River, for example, um, a manufacturer that was contributing wastewater to a wastewater treatment facility. And so they said, you know, this is a contributor to the wastewater treatment facility. The wastewater treatment facility is effluent, exceeds what we anticipate um, will cause an impact or cause an exceedance of the new surface water standards. And so this manufacturer installed a pretreatment system, so treating before it gets to the wastewater treatment system. Um, but unfortunately, that treatment system didn't have the desired impact. There was no resulting decrease in the effluent um, of the wastewater treatment facility or the levels in the Huron River. And so there was this question about, okay, well, now what do we do? We kind of went after the, the big sources, the ones that were obvious to us, but the, the, the whole load that the wastewater treatment facility has to deal with, as Steve alluded to in his PFAS cycle, uh, discussion is much more significant because it's coming from uh, our industry. It's coming from the, the things we do as part of our household and, and home use as well. There's a similar issue in the Flint River, again, where the Flint River concentrations exceeded the surface water standards. So uh, they identified a, a wastewater treatment facility that then looked upstream, identified its major contributors. And what's interesting about this is that uh, they identified a manufacturer that historically used PFO, 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 S, PFOS um, in, their, in their processes, but the sampling was done in 2018, and that facility had stopped using PFOS as part of their manufacturing in 2013. And so there was a, there's a five-year gap, and we're still uh, detecting concentrations of PFOS in the wastewater um, from that facility. And then at this location um, and relative to the Flint River, there's also some evaluation of the impact of wastewater treatment facility biosolids and their application um, as a stormwater runoff sort of aspect and impact to the Flint River. So really looking at the significant impacts of stormwater um, as well as wastewater treatment facility effluent as we're looking at adopting these lower surface water standards. So why is this relevant to uh, those of you who manage landfills and recycling centers and um, and uh, transfer stations. Well, on June 20, uh, excuse me, on June 1st in 2020, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, as long as well as New Mexico and Colorado, made a request to EPA that PFAS be added to the uh, list of monitoring requirements under the multi-sector general permit. So for the most part, um, recycling facilities, transfer stations, landfills are covered by the MSGP. Uh, you don't necessarily have these NIFTIs permits, which I'll talk about in a second, which generally are point discharges to a surface water body, but rather fall under the MSGP. So um, Massachusetts was specific in their request to EPA to add PFAS to monitoring for the list of facilities um, in the bullets on the slide, which obviously include landfills, land application sites, and open, open dumps. 
as well as scrap recycling and waste recycling facilities. So it's unclear how EPA will re respond to the request from these three states. Um, but the point is that EPA is being pushed from the states, sort of from the bottom up, to include PFAS in these um, MSGP sampling requirements. The challenge here is significant. If you have a transfer station, for example, where uh, you have municipal solid waste coming in and, and other material from other facilities, you know, you are dealing with stormwater. They're often very small uh, land area sites. Uh, you're dealing with significant stormwater challenges in and of them themselves, and there's no really good way to eliminate or minimize the impact of PFAS or to treat on those facilities um, without considerable cost. And I know Ivan will wrap around at the end of the presentation and talk about some of the treatment options, but what I can tell you right now is that none of them are going to work particularly well in this type of environment without a lot of expenditure of, of, of cash and, and um, resources. For those sites where there are specific point discharges to a surface water body and sites that have uh, NIPTES permits, uh, there's also some really interesting movement. MassDEP has actually issued new draft NIPTES permits to a handful of wastewater treatment facilities, as well as uh, Logan Airport, for example, that require those facilities to evaluate their use of PFAS and whether that use can be reduced or eliminated. In addition, it requires in inclusion of PFAS in the um, quarterly monitoring program, and it provides the rationale for DEP uh, and why they're looking for this information. Simultaneously, uh, the state of New Jersey has done the same thing. And so it's um, kind of an end around uh, EPA's process where EPA hasn't necessarily taken the lead again uh, being in a very reactionary sort of uh, position, EPA isn't leading on this, just like they haven't left, le left, let, excuse me, they haven't led on the drinking water and groundwater front. The states are really pushing EPA to, to adopt certain approaches when it comes to PFAS. And I think the impact here is really significant because each of these um, re will require at least potential evaluation of on site treatment of stormwater, um, not just leachate, which I know we'll talk about in a bit. Steve, what do you think about the impact of, of these changes? Do you have a perspective to add? I think that uh, you're you're right on line. These are going to make big differences. And you know, this example in stormwater is it, just such a big deal because when you get back to that waste study we looked at, they uh, analyzed, we analyzed a lot of sludges from industries that had no reason to suspect that PFAS was part of their sludge. Yet these compounds are showing up maybe from years ago history. They're stuck in the system somewhere and are slowly leaching out of soil somewhere, uh, as you probably saw in that example. Uh, but they're going to be surprises. People are going to have loadings that they didn't know anything about. And a lot of the products that come from overseas could have PFAS in them. And may even be labeled as PFAS free, but remember something at a part per million level can be significant when you're talking about part per trillion levels. So even though it might not have PFAS as a component, even those trace impurities might be issues in getting to these low levels. So it's a huge issue on the wastewater treatment side. Yeah, and as you know, as wastewater treatment facilities are impacted by these NIPTES discharge permit requirements in in uh, Massachusetts and New Jersey, you know that is ultimately going to almost immediately go upstream, right? The wastewater treatment facility has very little control over what they take in, very much like the landfills. Um, but what they can do is go upstream and say, you know, hey, landfill, um, you know, we can't take your uh, your leachate any longer because we now have these uh, surface water standards that we need to meet. Um, and so although the NIPTES permits don't always directly apply to landfills or uh, recycling facilities or transfer stations themselves because they're covered under the MSGP, I think the implication is that this is coming and that landfills are going to need to be uh, really keeping our heads up about how to deal with this um, and how to how to deal with it in leachate. So. Yeah, and the, the cost of monitoring is going to be significant. And, you know, as you alluded to, MassDEP, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, did a study in the Merrimack River where they 
were sampling for one specific source to see the impacts of it, but they went upstream and downstream and found PFAS at detectable levels, not above their 20 part per trillion level, but say at the three part per trillion level up and down the river. And identifying those sources is going to be a very interesting thing. It's going to bring a new uh, meaning to outfall sampling, I think, and you know, upstream, downstream. Yeah. Well, and if they adopt a standard for PFOS like Florida, I mean, that's four parts per trillion as a, as a reminder, right? So that doesn't take much to get over four parts per trillion. In fact, there are studies that su suggest that there is on average about four part, three to four parts per trillion in, in rainwater in sort of general areas, non-impacted non by specific point sources. Yep, it's gonna be a very tough problem and could be costly. Yep. So Steve, what about uh, PFAS in air? How how do we deal with <laughs> one from one challenge to the next? Uh, yeah, the, the PFAS air emission side of things is new to a lot of people, I'm going to guess. And it's, uh, it's an issue that's emerging, and I think it's going to be a big issue in about a year or two when some data start coming out. Like, the question here is why worry about PFAS and air emissions at landfills? I mean, uh, the first reason you should worry is it's probably in landfill gas. Some PFAS have significant volatility, and the evidence for this is mostly anecdotal at this point. There have been studies in uh, Germany and Canada and China that have measured higher levels of certain PFAS compounds near landfills and wastewater treatment plants, higher than the background levels in other areas. And the inference is that they have to be coming out of the emissions of uh, the wastewater treatment plants and the landfills. Uh, another reason to worry about this is as we take care of all the drinking water exposures, people are still going to be looking for those exposures to PFAS. And suddenly air exposure, exposure to dust, exposure to our diet is going to become much more important. And maybe the biggest reason to worry about this is that there's an impending data set that's going to get dropped on all of us. The University of North Carolina has been funded by EPA to measure PFAS in landfill gas. And uh, which has a lot of words on it, but basically uh, Professor Barlos's group at the University of North Carolina State University has been given $900,000 to go around the country and sample landfill gas. Now, we get a lot of questions about what that method is going to be because they have to develop the method. It might be some canisters, it might be something else. But chances are, based on that anecdotal evidence, they're going to find PFAS in landfill gas. And based on experience of public reactions in various places. As soon as we find PFAS in landfill gas, people are gonna start worrying about it, worrying about their exposure. It's just gonna be a new big release. Every landfill has fugitive emissions of landfill gas. And even more importantly, uh, the landfill gas usually gets treated. It gets collected, most of it, at a landfill and treated. And uh, Nikki alluded to the idea that, you know, a lot of people are, questioning as to whether we can destroy these compounds. They're hard to destroy. Are they destroyed in incineration? And especially in the combustion environments at a landfill, things like a flare, for instance, or worse yet, a, a big old energy recovery engine where the combustion is not always good in those systems. So are those systems releasing PFAS to the environment? So data are coming, and I think we need to be prepared for it. Here's a sense of where these data are coming from, and there's a, a lot on these figures, and I'll, I'll reference you to the Aaron's paper. There's a reference there if you want to look at this in detail. But basically the big blue, the bigger bars and the littler bars show levels measured near landfills or wastewater treatment plants, the big bars, and levels away from them. And you can see that in the blue bars at the top, what's happening is there seem to be excess levels of the fluorotelomer alcohols. Those are very volatile PFAS in the sort of 20 nanogram per cubic meter range. Uh, background about the same level, but there seems to be a doubling of background levels near landfills and wastewater treatment plants. Similarly, there's a doubling of things like the FOSA compounds. Much lower levels, but again, related to, you know, higher than background. So this is why people think there are emissions. Uh, one good thing about these chemicals is the fluorotelomer alcohols are thought not to be as toxic, but there's a catch there because they degrade. Uh, there are precursor compounds that degrade into the more toxic chemicals we worry about like BFOA and PFOS. So that's where the source of uncertainty might be right now. But this could lead to a heightening of our background exposure. This is again, uh, there are very few data and I suspect some landfills have taken data and really aren't publishing the data in landfill gas. 
but uh, very few published data are out there on landfills and landfill gas in particular. One place it does exist, there's a reference down there to a Minnesota Pollution Control Agency when the 3M site was being investigated in Michigan in sort of the late 2000, first decade. Uh, they went and they sampled landfill gas, and they sampled it for the perfluorinated compounds, not the compounds we look for now, which would be the fluorotelomer alcohols. But even there, they found things like PFOA. And PFOA is not a very volatile compound. You really have to ask yourself, why are they seeing PFOA in landfill gas? Probably related to the fact that landfill gas is pretty moist stuff and has a lot of aerosols in it before you knock those aerosols out, for instance, in a condensate trap. My guess is they were measuring particulate bound PFAS in the landfill gas, stuff that might show up in your condensate. Uh, but still, there are some measurements, and the levels there are, if you look at the units, this is pythogram cubic meter for the graph, so divide that by 1,000, it's on the 5 nanogram per cubic meter range. That's not too high compared to some other values that we're talking about. Uh, so it's probably not going to be, again, the traditional perfluorinated compounds that we worry about. Probably going to be worried about more of the fluorotelomer alcohols is what's going to come out of the landfill gas study. And that's what we need to be prepared for. So this really is unknown territory. And this slide has more questions on it than answers because there are so many questions. But this is what we want to be ready for. Um, data are going to emerge. Uh, PFAS uses have changed. So we're going to see different PFAS, probably the fluorotelomer alcohols. Uh, how will that change with time? Do cover soils attenuate PFAS? One of the things in the Professor Barless's study was to look at attenuation through cover soils. Do flares and IC engines destroy them? There's a million dollar question. I'd like to spend a few million dollars investigating that and know the answer to it myself. And what are the ultimate implications to exposure and global transport? You know, these chemicals are showing up in the polar regions. And how did they get there? You know, is it contributing sources like landfills over the years that have been emitting some of these compounds? Uh, interesting question. Anyway, Ivan, I think you're up next. Okay, uh, so I, Ivan is gonna tell us all about treatment technologies. It's, here, it's his area of expertise, Sneaking. I could speak to that, but we'd be deferring to his expertise here, which is what we're gonna do. So Ivan, take this away. Okay, thanks, Steve and Nikki, I appreciate it. Well, to wrap things up, we've heard a lot about PFAS sources and issues, but what to do about it? So we've been asked if PFAS can be destroyed or separated or contained. Here's an overview of some of the current state of treatment uh, and innovative technologies. So currently, the most effective technologies that are in wide use have been activated carbon, ion exchange, reverse osmosis, as well as deep well injection. But there's other innovative technologies as well. And some of those show a difference between either technologies for separating and concentrating PFAS or other technologies for destroying PFAS. So some of the technologies that have been used for groundwater as well as being looked at for landfill leachate, including ozone fractionation, where uh, bubbles of ozone or other uh, gases such as argon are bubbled through uh, PFAS groundwater and that PFAS, uh, PFAS constituents form on the outside of bubbles and uh, generate a foam at the surface. And the foam is removed and destroyed separately. There can be other adsorbents that have been looked at for PFAS removal, including biochar, um, some modified clays, polymers, and proteins. And as a matter of fact, we're looking at some uh, treatment technologies right now for uh, pilot scale usage of a modified clay that has this tremendous ability to adsorb PFAS constituents is unaffected by um, VOCs and, uh, and other constituents. So that's very promising. Electrocoagulation uh, is another technology that can help separate PFAS from landfill leachate. There are a number of destructive technologies as well, including uh, chemical oxidation, uh, chemical reduction, defluorination, uh, electrochemical oxidation, uh, but that requires some very, very intense uh, energy sources to break apart a very strong chlorine-fluorine bond. And that may be uh, a limiting factor in terms of the availability of the energy source. Sonolysis has also been evaluated because sonolysis um, impacts high energy waves 
uh, on a sound basis that cause cavitation and the cavitation when a very small bubble uh, compresses, generates a very high energy, very high temperature in a minute location, and that can destroy uh, PFAS as well. Plasma has also been used in several Air Force sites uh, where you have AFFF, and that has been used effectively. Um, people are looking at immobilized fungal degradation, uh, some biological anaerobic defluoridation, carbon nanotubes, um, electron gain, electron beam and gamma radiation. So there's a variety of technologies that are being looked at. Some of the concerns there is that most of these destructive technologies that are innovative stage are really looked at in the laboratory. Currently, very few have made it past uh, bench scale studies. There's very little uh, peer reviewed information, especially for landfill leachate destruction. And some of these require elevated temperatures, uh, high detention times, and uh, seem to be fairly complicated and costly. Where we've looked at a number of these technologies, comparing the maturity of the technologies with the feasibility of those technologies. And if you look at the the current usage of PFAS remediation technologies on the upper right, the deep well, activated carbon ion exchange, and some of the adsorbent technologies, especially the uh, modified clays, are on the upper right portion, meaning they're fairly mature and they're definitely feasible. The majority of the innovative technologies are down on the lower left, meaning that there's very uh, early stages of development and they're not a mature technology yet. So we've looked at probably 30 to 40 different technologies for separation as well as destruction of, of PFAS constituents, looking at uh, not only effectiveness, but also the residual, what's formed. And we see many of these technologies actually uh, will have a good effect for destroying the longer chain PFAS constituents, but they may be generating more of the shorter chain. So that's an important consideration to look at as well. Um, well, at this point, um, we want to thank Nikki Delude Roy, Steve Zemba for an excellent presentation. We have a couple of minutes for questions, at least one. So is, I understand Steve has a question for us. Actually, I, I might jump in before Steve, Ivan, if you don't mind. Um, I'm curious if you can speak to the practicality of some of the approaches that are there. So for landfills that have to deal with uh, leachate or transfer stations, recycling facilities that might have to look at stormwater in the next year or two because of regulation changes. Are any of these able to deal with um, issues when there's a complex matrix like stormwater or leachate? That's an excellent question, Nikki, thank you. Some of the conventional technologies have actually been used. Um, some of those include activated carbon, they may require some pretreatment as well, uh, as well as ion exchange. Some of the other constituents may involve um, some impact on the ability to work or the life expectancy of those media. However, each one requires some, uh, some bench or pilot scale test to really confirm uh, the longevity and the adequacy of treatment. So that's a um, conventional approach. Reverse osmosis has been used on landfill leachate, has an excellent ability uh, to remove the PFAS constituents. However, uh, management techniques of the residuals are actually important. We're also doing pilot testing on a modified clay that has a significant ability to absorb PFAS constituents, yet be unaffected by some of the other constituents, such as the VOCs, uh, the COD of the landfill ammonia. It's uh, not affected by that. And we're actually running some, some pilot tests now. So that may have an effect of uh, removing those PFAS constituents at a perhaps lower cost than some of those other technologies. And the residuals seem to be um, relatively easily managed by mixing with the lean concrete and disposed of in the landfill. And the leaching uh, components of that seems to be fairly small. But there's a lot of information and a lot of technology evaluations that still needs to be done because this is an evolving science. Well, thank you. Yeah, if I could follow that up, I mean, it when you're dealing with large flows like like leachate and or wastewater, especially if you went to wastewater treatment plants, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of dollar signs flash in front of my eyes here in terms of the potential costs associated with this. What would you tell facility operators? I mean, it's going to be facility specific, obviously, but is this going to be a major cost, a minor add-on cost, or what do you think? Yeah, and that's an excellent question because we see some of the costs are in the range of perhaps five to six cents per gallon 
for treating landfill leachate for pretreatment prior to discharge. And obviously can be somewhat more, somewhat less. It's, it's individual site specific. To involve some of these additional technologies, maybe looking at somewhere uh, possibly 50% increase of some of those numbers. Again, site specific, technology specific. Um, and we're very, very interested in some of these uh, um, modified clay adsorbents that may significantly lower the cost even more. Thanks, Ivan. Yeah. Um, Steve, can I ask you a quick question? Um, if you had a crystal ball, which I know you pretend to <laughs> sometimes, um, do you see the challenges around landfill gas really being the next frontier? I mean, uh, yes and no. I think like all things PFAS, there's going to be an initial reaction to data. I think it's the industry, though, gets out ahead of it that what you'll see, you, you got to quantify the exposure. This is a major source of exposure to how many people. And I think maybe a few people living around a landfill are going to have higher than average exposures. But air emissions tend to disperse relatively rapidly. The bigger question that if we wanted to address this, it's almost like climate change, would be what about global transport of PFAS? Because it's getting out there into rural Vermont soils, to the polar regions. That's probably the bigger issue. But in terms of people's exposure, I don't think landfill gas is going to be a big one. Uh, the big issue would be, though, if those fluoroteller alcohols do degrade into, say, the mm -hmm. Uh How do you quantify that? And there's reasons to believe that regulators will be conservative about it. I personally don't think it would be a big issue. But then again, you know, when I was a kid, I washed my hands in gasoline. So, you know, risk to me is a different thing. And the public will react for sure to this. I think the industry could be out on the forefront, though, doing some work beforehand to prepare for the data that are coming out. And so the messaging can go back and forth without just reactions. Yeah, that's what I was just going to add, was that it seems like a great opportunity for the industry to really advocate ahead of the, the regulations that might come once that data is released. So, The old Boy Scout motto, be prepared. That's right. Really appreciate it. Again, Nikki and Stephen, thank you very much for your participation. That was a great session. We all learned a lot, and you have our thanks. Thanks, Ivan. Bye, everybody. Thanks, thanks Ivan. Ivan. Thank you for listening. It would mean the world if you would take a moment to rate or review this podcast. And if you share it with us on one of our social networks, we are giving out some fun, nothing wasted podcast swag. So just tag us and see what you get. Thanks so much. Yeah.